Good afternoon. My name is Nigel Weir, and I will be the moderator for this uh, discussion and presentation this afternoon. Um, I would like to welcome you to the 131st Zoom talk sponsored by the Canadian Association for the Club of Rome, KCOR, as we call it. The title of today's topic is We Can't Wait, Delivering on Canada's Land and Ocean Protection Commitments. Um, we are quite aware of the arm alarming loss in biodiversity, the loss in forest area, the degradation of our ocean environments, the takeover of agricultural land by urban sprawl, and so on. Uh, and we have our preoccupation with climate change, which at times seems to suck the oxygen from the room. But global warming is closely linked to the exploitation of the biosphere. Canada has made progress in setting aside protected areas and in recent um, uh, announcements has made increased commitments. But how are these choices made? And what obstacles need to be overcome? Um, our speaker today is Alison Woodley, Senior Strategic Advisor with Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society, um, an organization that has a track record of influencing the public and policymakers. With many years of experience, including involvement overseas, um, Allison is well qualified to talk to us and take our questions. And we note that she is fresh from her role as an NGO delegate to the COP, to the Biodiversity COP15 conference held last fall in Montreal. So over to you, Allison. Thank you, Nigel, and thank you so much for inviting me to speak to you today. Um, it's, uh, I actually am very optimistic about, uh, about what's happening, and there is indeed good news, I think, to share, and at least hope. Um, lots of work to do, but hope uh, in the future. So today I'm going to... Um, I'm going to talk to you about Canada's land and ocean protection targets. Um, but before we get going on that, I am just going to say a little bit about the organization that I've had the honor of working with for over 20 years. <clears throat> the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society, known as CPAWS to many, um, is Canada's only conservation charity that's dedicated to the protection and effective management of public land, fresh water, and ocean in Canada for the benefit of both nature and people. <clears throat> we have a vision of protecting at least half of, of land, fresh water and ocean in Canada and making sure that's permanently protected to sustain nature and people now and into the future. CPAWS has had that bold vision since 2005. And we set that vision because the science was emerging that that was the scale of protection that was needed in order to actually save nature and to sustain people. At the time it was seen as a bit of an audacious <laughs> audacious dream by many. I never would have thought in 2005 when I did work for CPAWS that I would be speaking to you today about an agreement where 196 countries around the world had agreed to protect 30% of land and ocean by 2030. And this is a, an enormous step forward in terms of the commitment. And now, of course, it's a big challenge to actually deliver. I'd also like to just make a couple of points, which I think are foundational for this conversation. Our CPAWS works on public land. And what many people don't know is that almost 90% of Canada's landscape and all of our ocean is publicly managed and governed. It's under the jurisdiction of governments, whether they be federal, provincial, territorial, and indigenous governments. And so that means that in the vast majority of Canada, conservation is actually about in influencing public policy decisions. It's those public policy decisions that are needed um, to protect land, to protect ocean, to manage and restore land and ocean. <clears throat> in Southern Canada, private land dominates in the far south of our country. And there are many, uh, you know, our colleagues in, uh, in land trusts, 
play a critical role um, in conserving land in the, in the southern parts of Canada because they have the tools um, available to buy land and to use to tools like conservation agreement or conservation, <coughs> excuse me, um, easements, et cetera. But on public land, it really is a public policy issue. And so that's what CPAWS does. We work to encourage governments, to influence governments, to make positive conservation focused public policy decisions on public land and ocean in Canada. Another key thing to know about CPAWS is that we are an organization that has 13 chapters across the country, as well as a national office in Ottawa. And the reason that that is so important, we think, is because that mimics the structure of Canada, the federated structure that we have. In Canada, provinces and territories have primary decision-making authority over land and resources, with the federal government being primarily responsible for Canada's ocean estate. And so with our um, federated structure as CEPAWS, we have people working across the country with those provincial and territorial governments, as well as at the national level working with the federal government. And we also, of course, have people on the ground across the country working with Indigenous nations and communities, which is key to our success collectively as a country. But we also work in a very coordinated way so that we're not just 13 separate organizations doing our thing, we actually coordinate at the national level so we're able to produce the kinds of reports I'm going to be talking to you about today. And so I am very honored and proud to be having uh, have had the honor of working for CPAWS for all these years and uh, really wanted to share, share that with you. So today I'm going to work, talk about a number of things. I will share with you what a little bit about what Canada's land and ocean protection targets are right now. Um, a bit about why they're so important, why it is so urgent that we need to scale up our protection of land and ocean as well as talk about the global policy context and what has been achieved over the past decade as well as lessons uh, learned. And then I'll talk a li little bit as well about the roadmap to achieving Canada's land and ocean protection targets. And I'll end by putting that all in the context of the new global biodiversity framework. So it's a bit of an ambitious agenda and I hope I can get through it all in a reasonable time. So just to get going, what are Canada's land and ocean protection targets? Well, as Nigel mentioned um, and was described in the description of my talk, Canada has embraced um, a target at the federal level of protecting at least 25% of our lands and waters by 2025 and 30% of each by 2030. They've also, in, and this was first committed to in 2019 during the federal election, and it was reaffirmed during the federal election in 2021 and in the, and in the subsequent time past that. <clears throat> in 2021, Canada also made a broader commitment for the first time setting these land and ocean protection goals within the broader context of a, of a very ambitious goal to halt and reverse nature's loss by 2030 and to ensure its recovery by 2050. So for the first time, we really have that nature, the land protect, land and ocean protection goals nested within a broader biodiversity conservation overarching goal, which I think is really important. And of course, coming out of COP15, biodiversity COP15, um, there is now a similar global target for as part of the new global biodiversity framework. So why is this so important and so urgent? And I don't think, I think this group is probably well aware, but I, I will reiterate just a few points of why this is so urgent. First, I think it's important to, to understand that land use change resulting in habitat loss and degradation is still the primary driver of biodiversity loss on land. And overexploitation is the primary direct driver of biodiversity loss in the ocean, which basically means overfishing. And these were the conclusions in, in the 2019 global assessment that was done by the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, known as IPBES, which is the equivalent of the IPCC, but for biodiversity. It's the group of scientists around the world who do assessments of the status of nature and what's happening globally. <laughs> They're the group that reported in this same report in 2019 
that there's a million species at risk likely around the world and that nature is collapsing faster now than at any time in human history and that that will have significant impacts on human well-being. So given that habitat loss is the primary driver still, we need to make sure that habitat protection and restoration is at the heart of all of our efforts to restore nature. Climate change is a significant direct driver. It was assessed as being still third in, in its significance behind, um, behind habitat loss and degradation and overexploitation, but it is, as we all know, growing in significance. A similar, uh, a couple of years ago, there were some studies done to look at how much protection is enough to actually save nature. And a review paper that is linked in the slide in the second bullet found that at least 30%, 30% is the absolute floor, at least 30%, and as much as 70% or more of ecosystems, depending on the ecosystem, need to be conserved to reverse nature's decline and safeguard a healthy planet. And so this study also found that the, uh, the goal of uh, or the, the target of protecting half actually has a scientific basis to it. And it is, it, is, um, it, is, it is a reasonable assessment that on average, we need to be looking at protecting half. So the 30% target that has been set both nationally and globally is really a floor of where, need, where we need to get to, but it is a huge step forward within this decade. Recently, there's been much more recognition of the importance and the interconnections, as Nigel referenced, between nature conservation and restoration and climate change. So the linkages between the biodiversity and the climate crises. And we're seeing this at, at climate COPs, where protecting nature is becoming much more of a, of a focus of these COPs, and also at the biodiversity COPs, where there's a recognition of the linkages with climate change. So just to, to focus on one study that was released in 2017 that found that over one third of cost-effective climate mitigation needed by 2030 can be achieved through nature conservation and restoration. So there is no pathway to net zero without nature conservation being part of the plan. And of course, nature so nature conservation can contribute to both mitigation and adaptation to climate change. And of course, it also threatens biodiversity. So um, climate change is a big threat to biodiversity. So important to be working on um, ambitious targets to address both crises. And just a quick reminder that we are not immune to the biodiversity crisis in Canada. Often we look north and think that we're doing okay and better than elsewhere in the world, but that's actually sadly not the case. Um, the image in this slide shows, is it's an old one, it's from a great report that, um, that federal provincial territorial governments did in 2010 on ecosystem status and trends in Canada that hasn't, sadly hasn't been repeated, um, but it showed that all Canadian ecosystem types are in decline. We now have over 700 species at risk of extinction as identified by the um, COSIWIC, which is the Committee on the Status of, uh, of uh, Endangered Species in Canada. And a recent WWF Canada report showed that populations of species at risk in Canada have declined almost 60% on average since 1970. So we do have a crisis. It's equivalent to the global crisis and we have to take urgent action to address it. So taking a step outwards to the broader global policy context of where the targets for protecting land come from at the global level. The UN Convention on Biological Diversity was signed in 1992 at the Rio Earth Summit alongside the UNFCCC, which is the better known UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So these conventions were brought forward at the global level together. They're meant to work together to address together the crisis, the crises that we face on the environment. The CBD, as it's, as it's generally known, um, has three goals. It's not only the conservation of biological diversity, but also the sustainable use of its components, and importantly, the fair and equitable sharing of the benefits arising from the utilization of genetic resources. So it has a broad, uh, a broad set of goals. There are 196 countries who are signatories or parties to the CBD, 
And the only parties that aren't, the only countries that aren't are the United States, which uh, signed the agreement but never ratified it for various reasons, and the Holy See, the Vatican. So it is an, one of the um, most, um, has one of the biggest kind of uh, number of parties in the world of any UN treaty. We often hear that it's not uh, legally binding, the CBD, and it's actually not true. It is part of the international legal framework, so it is part of international law. The challenge is that there aren't any enforcement mechanisms associated with it. So yes, it's legally binding, but there are no, uh, not many consequences to countries that don't actually follow it. So that's, that's a bit of an issue. It operates under a consensus process. So in order to get agreement, you have to have basically all 196 countries agree or, or the majority, all of them that are present at the meeting, um, which can also be challenging. And it's all, I always think a bit of a miracle when you do get something done, when you have to have unanimous consent. Um, and it's governed by a conference of the parties, which is where COP, the word COP comes from. And the secretariat is in Montreal, which is why COP 15, landed in Montreal after it was moved from China because of the, uh, the pandemic, because largely because the Secretariat is in Montreal, so Canada has a, a special responsibility to the convention as the host to the Secretariat. Over the last decade, we've been working on slightly smaller targets, um, but that were important nonetheless, that were tied to the 2010 strategic plan under the CBD. Uh, and these were, which included four goals and 20 targets. Um, and those 20 targets uh, were known as the Aichi targets. So if you have heard of the Aichi targets, they are under the CBD. And target 11 of those 20 Aichi targets was the protected areas target. And it um, called on countries to protect at least 17% of land and inland waters and 10% of coastal and marine areas uh, by 2020. And, particular, and it also had a number of very important quality measures in it that have also um, been carried forward into the, the latest uh, global biodiversity framework target, including things like making sure we protect the right places, the areas that are most important for biodiversity making sure these areas are connected in networks of protected areas, that they're ecologically representative. Um, and and I'm, I'm just gonna call, a, call your attention to a number of words in the target now, because I'll address them later, that the, the tools available um, to be counted as part of these targets included protected areas and other effective area-based conservation measures. And protected areas are well-known tools. There's an international framework that defines them under the International Union of the Conservation of Nature, the IUCN. Other effective area-based conservation measures was a new term that emerged, um, negotiated in the middle of the night as they were trying to gavel the entire agreement. And it's taken us basically the whole decade to figure out what that means, but I'll get into that a little bit um, further on. After this new global framework was passed in 2010, Canada really didn't do much with it until for the first half of the decade. We were very late to the game in getting going in a concerted way on implementing any of it. Um, what, what was done was that Canada over the first five years came up with its own set of um, targets and goals based on the global framework um, and strangely, for some strange reason, renamed Target 11 to Canada Target 1, just to confuse, which is a bit confusing for many people. And unfortunately, a number of the targets were actually dropped. So we did come up with our, frame, our own framework over the first five years, but there was not much energy that went into implementation, basically very little. However, in 2015, we had a federal election. Um, it was unclear who was going to win that election at that point. And so we at CPAS saw this as an opportunity to secure a stronger commitment to actually implement the 17 and 10% targets that had been laid out in Target 11 and Canada Target 1. And we managed to get um, a number of, uh, of uh, political parties to put this in their platform. And one of those actually won the election. And so over the next subsequent months, 
this target became part of their um, agenda and uh, adopted as and was adopted as government policy. And this was really um, a bit of a turning point in terms of a, being a concerted effort and me, be, becoming a major driver of progress over the next few years. In order to deliver on this target, there was a recognition by the federal government that they needed federal, provincial, and territorial ministers who were responsible for parks protected areas and biodiversity conservation from across the country to buy into this program, to buy into this goal of, of expanding protection to 17% on land um, by 2020. And so they launched on the terrestrial side, um, what was called the Pathway to Canada Target One which was, in my view, quite a transformational process. They set a goal of, in partnership with Indigenous peoples and with other relevant sectors of Canadian society, grounded in science and Indigenous knowledge systems, to establish a coordinated and connected network of parks and conservation areas throughout Canada that would serve as the cornerstone for biodiversity conservation for generations to come. So this was a, an initiative that really set the pathway to expanding our network of protected areas across the country with the buy-in of provincial territorial governments and with importantly, with the engagement of indigenous peoples with the involvement of national indigenous organizations and advisory um, panels. Reconciliation was at the front of the list of principles that was set for this, for this group, for this initiative. A number of advisory panels were struck and reports um, written. Um, I was, I had the honor along with uh, three other CPAWS staff and trustees or former trustees in being on the national advisory panel. There was also an indigenous circle of experts set up to task specifically with advising on how this agenda could move forward in the, in the, uh, in the framework and the practice of reconciliation. And there was an intergovernmental steering committee that wrote a report based on the advice of these two advisory panels. And in my view, this really was a transformational process. It was the most remarkable government process I've ever been involved with. There was a real um, different uh, approach to these, advice, to these advisory panels and to the process. They were Indigenous and non-Indigenous groups. Um, uh, there were representatives on the advisory panels. We worked um, in ceremony, we had elders advising our work. Um, we, uh, it, was, it was really quite a transformational um, approach. Ethical space and reconciliation um, was at the forefront of the dialogue of both, indigen of both advisory panels. <clears throat> and since then, um, Indigenous protected and conserved areas and Indigenous guardians programs have become central to achieving protection targets. So this really was a turning point for how we do protection of land and ocean in Canada um, through these various processes. As a result, after a big campaign, building on this commitment and recognizing there was investment needed to deliver on the commitment, in budget 2018, the federal government made the biggest conservation investment in Canadian history. $1.3 billion over five years for protected areas and species at risk. Now, for conservation, this is a sea change. I remember, um, and there was, <laughs> I remember a number of years ago running around Ottawa advocating for $25 million for species at risk and uh, to, to kind of for Environment Canada to work on species at risk and help save all those endangered species in Canada. There was a moment where I realized that this, we were in many ways our own worst enemy in terms of thinking small when there was an announcement in my local community of $25 million to extend a highway nearby 0.7 kilometers in distance. And so at that moment, <laughs> it was for me uh, a bit of a light bulb moment that we needed to think bigger and we needed to um, ask bigger in order to get, uh, to get bigger. And so there was a culmination of many things where the environmental community came together with a whole lot of partners and with the support of, of people inside government to really advocate for a billion dollar plus investment in conservation, recognizing the importance and that was what was necessary. This is now um, kind of really transformed 
the thinking of how much money is needed for, for conservation. The budget 2021 actually included $3.2 billion for conservation. And this is making a big difference across the country. I'm going to take a little bit of, a, of an aside moment here to talk about what counts as protected under these frameworks of, of, and these targets, because I think it's important to understand, and you'll see a little bit later on why, why it's important to have at least a little bit of a, of a, a context for this. <laughs> so under the targets and in the Canadian context of the targets, any things that are that qualify as protected areas, as other effective area based conservation measures, which are often called OECMs or have been come to be called OECMs, and indigenous protected and conserved areas are all considered um, elements that count towards the targets. In my view, one of the key achievements um, of the pathway to target. Canada Target 1 um, between 2017 and 2020 was an agreement amongst governments at all levels of what constituted a protected area and an OECM and an IPCA. So there was a lot of work that went into that seemingly rather tedious and, and, uh, and accounting kind of exercise of figuring out what we could agree on at, that should count. And, and so as part on, and there was an accounting working group um, set up under the pathway. I also was on that accounting working group along with other uh, colleagues in the NGO community and uh, government representatives. And we came up with, um, with a decision support tool that and guidance um, that goes into great detail of what the criteria are that, that need to be met and how they can be met along with case studies, et cetera, et cetera. So there, there is quite a detailed um, description now of uh, not only of protected areas, which was already fairly well articulated, but more importantly of OECMs and what they mean and what does constitute an OECM and what doesn't. And that those um, decision support tools are all built on figuring out what is necessary in order to effectively conserve biodiversity in the long term. So these are really important platforms to set us up for the next decade's work. <laughs> it's also important to understand that provinces and territories actually do the counting of what is protected in their jurisdiction. Um, because they have jurisdiction over land and resources, they actually decide what is what counts under the under the national target, and then the feds manage the database and then report out internationally. But having all the provinces and territories consistently counting is something that we're striving towards. It's uh, it's a, it's an ongoing challenge, and in fact, OECMs um, have created some confusion and many people think that they should, they are um, a lower standard of protection, but that according to the international guidance that's been developed and the Canadian guidance that's based on that international guidance, that's not the case. They are meant to have de to deliver equivalent outcomes for conservation. And the key difference between an OECM and a protected area is that an OECM doesn't have to have primary conservation objectives while a protected area does. And to just give you one example of, of, an, of something that would qualify as an OECM, if there is, for example, an area of forest upstream from a community that is protected because it's the water supply for the community, the goal of protecting that area is, is protecting clean, plentiful water. It's not protecting biodiversity. However, the outcome of protecting that area also effectively conserves the ecosystem. And so that would be an example of something that wouldn't actually meet the definition of a protected area because it doesn't have a primary conservation objective, but it delivers an equivalent outcome. And so that this is a bit of a diversion from, from the core talk, but I did, OECMs are coming up a lot in conversation and I did want to just touch on that and we can, if anyone has any questions, we can discuss it later. So in, at the end of the decade, um, CEPA, we in 2019 and 2021, as I've mentioned, Canada set new, more ambitious targets, which was great. 
In 2021, CPAWS produced a report card on how well Canada had done over the previous decade in delivering on the 17 and 10% targets in order to inform our work over the next decade to, to kind of come up with some lessons learned on what went well, what worked, what didn't, and then to guide, that would, should help guide the, the kind of work forward to the more ambitious targets. So what did we find? Well, by 2020, Canada did achieve the ocean target. And that was largely because oceans are under federal jurisdiction. The federal government had um, adopted the targets and really put that into their core policy framework. And they did deliver on the targets. As you will see from this graph, they did it not only by creating protected areas, but also by counting um, OECMs in the marine realm. So by 2020, they had 13.8% um, in uh, protected areas and OECMs in the marine realm. Some of CPAWS pointed out that some of these areas that were counted as OECMs didn't actually meet the standards. They are now reviewing those. They have put out new guidance on OECMs. So we're hoping that they, some of those areas may be, will be upgraded to better meet the standards. On land, it was more challenging. We did make progress, um, but again, provinces and territories are responsible. So they have to, in large part, um, do the heavy lifting to actually protect land on the ground. Um, and we did move in Canada from 9.5% to 13.1% protected. Uh, and some of those were in OECMs. Uh, some provinces counted OECMs in, in, their, in their accounting systems. So we made progress but we didn't actually meet the target. This is an interesting graph because I think it actually shows the importance of setting the big targets and having the, the political will that that generates. You will note that we did, well, in the ocean, we did virtually nothing until the federal government, the new federal government came in and adopted the, the targets. Um, and then we made a huge leap forward um, to 2020. But even on land, um, the 2016, 27, 2017 was a big year where really things started to move forward and we started to make progress. And this was after the Pathway to Canada Target One had got underway. Provinces and territories had all agreed to work together to deliver on the targets and we started to make progress. We didn't get to 17% but we also started very late and conservation takes time. And so, um, you know, we are, we are pleased that, um, that the, the, the curve is going in the right direction and that we're well set up to, to move to the more ambitious targets over the next decade. In our report, we actually did a report card. We, did, we gave governments grades based on how well they had done and how much they had contributed to achieving Canada's targets um, over the decade. And as you can see from this slide, the grades varied very widely <laughs> across the country. Um, we said set criteria on what needed to be, uh, what, how to set these grades, but you'll see that um, Ontario, Newfoundland and Labrador, Alberta and Saskatchewan got Ds or Fs. Um, and that basically meant that they made no progress or in some cases they were going backwards. The top performers over the decade were the Northwest Territories with a B plus and Quebec with an A minus, as well as the federal government with a B plus on marine and an and a, a minus on terrestrial. I will call out Quebec here because Quebec was the only jurisdiction that actually had adopted the 17 and 10% targets right when they were, um, when they were uh, made international, when the commitment was made internationally, and they met them. So they, they didn't get a full A because they didn't do as much work as they should have in southern Quebec, and that, maintained, that uh, continues to be a problem, but they did set the targets and they met them. The federal government on land uh, got a, um, earned a, 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 well, they earned a B plus in the ocean for meeting the protection target. They dropped a little bit because of the fact that some of these areas didn't meet the required standards. 
And the feds earned an A minus for land protection because of their commitment to the targets to supporting indigenous led conservation and for their billion dollar investment in conservation, including for partners to protect more land, which was a, a, a shift in how conservation is funded. So what did we learn overall from the CEPAS report card? Well, we learned first of all that political will is essential to, de to, to deliver that indigenous leadership is driving success, that federal leadership and funding is actually crucial to encourage action by provinces and territories, that conservation takes time. And so we need to start now to protect 30% of the land and ocean by 2030. We can't wait till 2028 or 2027 to get going on the 2030 targets. And also that many provincial governments are still a barrier to advancing conservation. We need more public pressure to get them on board. So having looked back and looked at the lessons learned from the last decade, CEPAS then went and, and did a report um, on kind of setting a roadmap to achieving the 30 by 2030 targets um, in Canada. And we started by asking ourselves the question, if all existing protection opportunities across the country were completed, how close would we get to the 30 by 30 target? And then we really wanted to see if, um, how achievable this was. And we wanted to demonstrate, we, we sensed it was achievable. And we wanted to demonstrate to governments across the country that this is not a pie in the sky idea. It's not, um, uh, it's not something that, you know, is unachievable. We can get there if we really put our minds to it. And so what we learned was we basically, once we had collated all the opportunities that we knew about across the country as, uh, as CPAWS, there were dozens of opportunities for protection. Most of them are Indigenous led. And if all of these were actually implemented by 2030, we would come very close within a hair, within a <coughs> Excuse me. A hair's breadth of achieving the 30% target on land, and we would exceed the target in the ocean. <coughs> Excuse me. To give you a sense of what that looks like, these are uh, this is an image of all of the <clears throat> opportunities that we identified across the country on land on the left and in the ocean on the right. They vary in scale and scope in leadership and what those look like, but they, they are all significant existing opportunities and proposals. <clears throat> we also recognize that things are very different jurisdiction to jurisdiction, region to region. So we went through and we did an analysis for each province and territory, as well as for the federal government on what the current status was of protection, what the recent change had been what the current opportunities were and how much they could contribute to, to the targets. So just to give you an example, one example of that analysis from, that, from our report, um, the Yukon was currently in last year in 2022 when we released the, point, the, the report at 19.1% protection. They have the highest level of protection in the country now. <clears throat> And that was due to a significant change over the course of the previous year when the Peel River watershed, a massive wild watershed in Northern uh, Yukon was actually got to the stage of being able to be counted as protected, which added over 7% of the territory to, to their protection to protected areas network. We also identified that if all the opportunities that were currently underway and commitments that were made and planning processes that were in play were completed, they could get to 42% protection. <clears throat> this is largely due to indigenous leadership and land use planning in the territory. So this is what that looks like in the report. Uh, we identified the areas where there were opportunities, the size of those opportunities roughly, and then did an assessment of, of the total area that that would bring and um, could contribute to the targets. And then we made policy recommendations for each government as well. And you'll see just from this one for the government of the Yukon, we recommended that they adopt a target of 30% by 2030 with a milestone of 25 by 25. And I will say that at COP, uh, we were very pleased that the government of the Yukon adopted the 25 by 25 
target and said that they would uh, be working towards 30 by 30. We also noted the need for funding for First Nations to do advanced land use planning preparation for land use planning initiatives and that there was also a commitment to that at COP as well. And then there were a number of other recommendations and we made these, we did this for each um, jurisdiction across the country and you, you can find the report on our website if you're interested in your province or territory. So this is what it looked like across the country. The, the opportunities vary greatly between regions. And these are all, remember, these are existing opportunities, not new opportunities that could be created. These are ones that are already underway. Key findings that ran throughout the report. Um, I think the biggest one is really around Indigenous-led conservation. Across the country, Indigenous governments are developing leading edge landscape and seascape level plans and proposing Indigenous protected and conserved areas, Indigenous guardians programs to conserve their traditional territories and bringing, bring together Western science and Indigenous knowledge to, to, in these planning processes. So supporting Indigenous-led conservation is an absolutely essential part of reconciliation in Canada. And it's also the pathway to success in terms of delivering on these targets. We need provinces and territories on board. That's uh, very clear and um, it's only possible. It's uh, achieving our land and ocean protection targets is only possible if governments at all levels work together to deliver. And we are starting to see movement and getting more um, provinces and territories on board. And I'll talk about that a little bit more when I talk about COP. And another key finding, of course, is that it's not just about, this is about conserving nature, it's not about area-based targets, and so we can't just think about, well, the targets are actually great at driving progress, we also have to keep in mind what areas we're protecting and make sure that we're protecting those that are most important for biodiversity, making sure these areas are well connected, that we keep in mind quality as well as quantity in delivering on the targets. And that can sometimes be a challenge. These targets can be really helpful in driving governments to do more, but it's, sometimes it's, it's challenging to keep the focus on the quality and the quantity. <laughs> so that's kind of just an overview of where we're at on the targets. Um, and I will just spend a few minutes talking about COP15 because honestly, this was a very exciting um, place to be in December. And I was honored to be there as with the CPAWS uh, delegation, but also on the, uh, the Canadian, uh, the formal Canadian delegation as, a, as an NGO representative. Um, and I've worked, I've been working on this for four years. So it was really, really amazing to be at the COP. And this is COP15 under the CBD. Just to, to a, a couple of, kind of background pieces on this. The COP was only moved to Montreal from China. The announcement was made um, in June. So Canada had five months to organize a COP that normally takes two years to organize. It also wasn't just any COP. <laughs> this was the equivalent for biodiversity of what Paris was for climate change. This was the moment when the world was, um, was scheduled to approve the next decade's global biodiversity framework. So it was, it was a big moment. It was a once a decade moment for biodiversity conservation. And I have to say that I was proud to be a Canadian at COP15. Canada played a key leadership role. It wasn't easy. Um, China was the president of the COP because when it moved from China to Canada uh, because of the pandemic, China retained the presidency and Canada became the host. So diplomatically, that obviously is, is challenging, um, but they did a, Canada did a masterful job and, and China and Canada worked well together in terms of delivering on this uh, important, uh, important piece. Going into the COP, the text of the global biodiversity framework was frankly a mess. It was full of square brackets. And many of us just wondered how on earth we were going to get out of the other end of COP after a couple of weeks with a, a global biodiversity framework that made sense. And yet we did. It came together. 
Canada was, and Canada played a really important part in that. And Minister Gilbo played a really important part of that. Canada was a champion of the 30 by 30 target. They provided strong support for recognizing indigenous rights and um, support, supporting indigenous led conservation. They committed uh, a really, they made a really important international commitment to international biodiversity funding right at the beginning of the COP, which set the stage for other countries and really encouraged them to put money on the table. Having enough money for developing countries to implement the global biodiversity framework was a key barrier at the beginning of the meeting to landing the, an ambitious deal because countries were reasonably saying, developing countries were reasonably saying, well, we can't agree to a big, uh, an ambitious framework unless there's enough money on the table to implement. Minister Gibbo's presence, oops, sorry. I jumped ahead by mistake. It's doing well there. <laughs> um, Minister Gibbo's presence, uh, he was everywhere. He was at NGO events. He was at uh, government events. He um, was championing ambition. He was working behind the scenes. It was really, really great. I think the other thing that was really impressive about COP was the really significant presence that Indigenous peoples had at COP throughout the program, both in the formal program, in the informal program, in the side events, et cetera. And Indigenous peoples from Canada really um, played an important role in, in framing, it, framing the opportunity that um, Indigenous-led conservation offers to addressing Indigenous rights issues um, and the potential for a positive path forward. Obviously, there is an enormous amount of work that's needed to uh, reconcile the horrific wrongs of the past that come from colonialism. But the way that Indigenous-led conservation was portrayed at COP was really um, in largely pointing to a hopeful path forward, that this is an opportunity to do things differently, that we need to embed Indigenous rights centrally in the global biodiversity framework and in the implementation of that framework, and that there were opportunities to do things differently and better. And obviously we recognize that different parts of the world, indigenous peoples are recognized or not recognized in different ways, but, but there was a strong presence of indigenous leadership at COP both inside and outside the venue. I just wanted to come to go over a couple of key elements of the new biodiversity framework that was struck. And I also just want to flag this photograph because I think it really represents well what I just spoke to in terms of Indigenous leadership. This was an announcement that was being made at COP um, between the Government of Canada, the Government of Manitoba, and um, the Seal River Watershed Alliance, which is an alliance of First Nations in northern Manitoba who were working to create an indigenous protected area that is 50,000 square kilometers in size. It's absolutely massive. Um, and at the announcement, Stephanie Thorisey, who is the executive director of the Seal River Watershed Alliance, the First Nations of Wild Watershed Alliance, spoke centrally. And I just love this photograph because she is at the core of that announcement. And the government officials are kind of on the sides and and watching her eloquent um, pr presentation. And I just think it really represents um, a hopeful future for working together between indigenous governments and crown governments in Canada on conservation. So key elements of the new global biodiversity agreement, there are four goals and 23 targets in this new framework. Target three is the 30 by 30 target, which uh, requires that countries protect at least 30% of land and ocean globally by 2030. It also included the quality measures, connectivity, um, indigenous, uh, sorry, uh, equitable governance, uh, effective management, and of critical importance, and this is an improvement over the target 11 in 2010, it requires that indigenous rights be respected and indigenous territories be recognized in implementation. So that's kind of the core one that CPOS works on, but there are also many complementary targets that are, it's a very comprehensive framework and many targets that actually relate to area-based conservation. So for example, target one requires that 
all that countries have all of their areas under spatial planning processes in, that that recognize the importance of biodiversity and that focus on retaining um, retaining remaining intact landscapes. So or ecosystems, landscapes, and seascapes. So that will be a really important um, target for Canada as well, because we do have significant intact ecosystems. Target two, really important, a, a, a commitment to restore 30% of degraded landscapes by 2030. That is a very ambitious target. There's also targets on increasing financing for biodiversity on uh, a commitment to reform subsidies. And I heard subsidies being discussed earlier in the preamble to this talk, um, reforming subsidies that harm nature. So this is going beyond fossil fuel subsidies to look at subsidies that are causing the degradation of nature. And Canada's also committed to doing that. And also importantly, how can we mainstream biodiversity across governments and sectors so that biodiversity is considered in all aspects of policy and decision making and there's a requirement to do that work as part of this framework. And again, stronger recognition and respect for Indigenous rights and leadership in implementing the framework is really central throughout this new framework. This is a really long list and I'm not going to go through the list, but I also wanted to mention that yeah. at COP, um, we went into COP hoping that there would be um, not only an ambitious global biodiversity framework, but that there would also be um, progress made in Canada, that having the COP in Canada would be an incentive for governments to make announcements on conservation. And wow, uh, I think this exceeded even our expectations. There, This is the list of, uh, and I've probably missed a few, this is the list of, of announcements that were made by Canadian governments, federal, provincial, territorial, Indigenous governments um, to move forward to that to advance conservation in Canada. So, for example, I mentioned in the Yukon, the Yukon committed to 25 by 25 and working towards 30 by 30, as well as there was money involved in the uh, agreement they signed with the feds. Um, BC, um, they, this didn't happen at COP, but they did commit um, at during COP to embrace the 30% by 2030 target to implement it in British Columbia. And it, it appeared in a ministerial mandate letter during COP. Quebec invested $650 million of new money to deliver 30 by 30. The federal government committed $800 million to fund four indigenous, huge um, indigenous led conservation initiatives in, in the NWT, BC and Nunavut. Manitoba, I mentioned this one, agreed to advance the Seal River indigenous protected area with Parks Canada and local First Nations, um, and on and on, and you can read the list, but there was just so much um, that happened at COP that really has built an enormous amount of uh, momentum that we need to capitalize on moving forward. Alison, are we very yeah. close to-, to I, I'm on my last slide, yeah. Okay, wonderful, so, I got a lot of questions. Yeah, okay, um, and so, of course, what's next? We have we are riding on a huge amount of momentum, both with ambitious targets, progress, and COP15, the Global Biodiversity Framework. What needs to happen next is that Canada is now obliged to create a nat what's called a National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan, or an NBSAP, to implement the full framework in Canada. And so that will be an effort that happens over the coming years, CEPAWS and other environmental uh, NGOs are coordinating around influencing that strategy to ensure it's ambitious and, uh, and implementable. At COP, the minister also um, made a new commitment to a Federal Biodiversity Accountability Act, and this would be like the Climate Change Accountability Act that the federal government has uh, enacted to enhance the federal government's accountability to deliver on the global framework. So that's very exciting. Of course, we need to continue the work to implement the 30 by 30 target, um, building on the momentum. And I just wanted to flag for those of you who may be interested in getting involved that just before COP, um, CEPAS launched a new campaign called We Can't Wait. And that um, is really meant to encourage Canadians to get involved in the effort to protect at least 30% of Canada by 2030, to be able to see what's going on in their regions. It's, it's early days for the campaign, but there, if you'd like to get involved, you can visit the website and, uh, and see um, how to get engaged. <laughs> 
And that is it for me. And thank you very much uh, for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Alison, for such a complete uh, uh, presentation. And, and you know, I know it's difficult to <laughs> cover such a, a broad area of, of, uh, of, 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 of an issue. But um, so we have quite a few questions. And Madeline Weld, um, I'll give you the first question. And on, uh, on, on, on deck would be uh, William Reese. Okay, so my question pertains to, um, oh, well, I, I, it's a long, long question written out, but basically 93% um, of um, the population of Ontario lives on about uh, what 15% of its territory and at the COP uh, in Montreal Prime Minister Trudeau designated four big protected areas and they all seem to me to be pretty remote and not really threatened by things like population growth. One of them was the um, Hudson Bay, Hudson's Bay lowlands of Ontario which is almost a quarter of the province and territory but has 10,000 people so it seems to me that designating that as a protected area is kind of meaningless because nobody's going to live in the bogs, the, in the peat marshes or whatever there anyway. So uh, the, the question is, how do we get the politicians to make meaningful protected areas? What really needs protection is Southern Ontario, which um, in the, especially the Western part in the GTA, which is massively growing and they're going to start building on the on the green belt because you know we're bringing in 500,000 people a year close to and um, they've got to live somewhere and Toronto's already bursting at the seams so you know I think it's great to have all these protected areas but in some ways it strikes me as a bit meaningless if you're protecting areas where nobody's going to live anyways. Yeah thanks Madeline I certainly agree with you that we need to focus on more protection everywhere but I also think I also I disagree that it's meaningless to protect the northern areas. There are different strategies that need to be taken in different parts of the country, but there are a lot of threats, not from people living there, but from resource sector development, for example. Right, but that's um, because mining, forestry. In, if if there weren't people wanting those products, there wouldn't be, you know, they wouldn't need to be developed. So I guess my question is, how does you know the the whole population growth factor? fit in there both by direct impact yeah through through you know building houses and stuff and yeah so certainly in southern Canada where you know that's where people live you're right most people live very close to the southern to the American border in Canada the vast majority of people and Ontario so 40 percent of Canadian yeah. population and gets about 60 percent of the immigrants I think yes yeah. so I mean we do need to do we do need to do conservation in southern Canada it's a different challenge so there's an interesting framework that was put forward as part of the conversation that led up to COP and the global biodiversity framework called the three conditions framework. And it can be applied globally and it can be applied at the national level. And it basically, it's quite a simple concept really. It basically says, we have to recognize that 30% protection isn't possible everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, for example, in Southern Ontario, there's not even 30% of the landscape, not even 17% of the landscape available for protection in an intact natural state. But it doesn't mean we don't have to take conservation action in Southern Ontario. It's just a different challenge. We need to save the remnants of natural areas that are left. And then we need to implement a massive restoration project. And I know that there are groups that are working. Our chapter, the Wildlands League, is working with partners. Um, there's many, I mean, Carolina in Canada, there are many organizations, Nature Conservancy of Canada, working on that challenge where in the Southern landscape where the threat, you're right, is, is urban development um, and transportation corridors and things. And that they're working to save these last remnants of nature and then are, to build out kind of restoration of, of are any, connected Are any landscape. of these environmental groups challenging the government's um, massive Absolutely. population the green, program? The Green Belt? Well, well no, no, I mean, this program of, of deliberately increasing Canada's population by half a million a year. I mean, is, are I, I can't answer. I can't answer that. I don't know. <laughs> so CPAS is not, though. No, we're working on proactive kind of land conservation efforts, including in southern, including in southern Canada. I will also flag that 
Um, the government of Canada has made a commitment to create 15 new national urban parks by 2030, um, including one in each province at least. And that's kind of the start of their urban park uh, system. So that's one thing that they're doing in the urban environment. And I, I do recognize that in most cases, those areas, if they're still exist in a natural state, already have some level of protection, but hopefully that will en enhance that protection and also kind of build out the capacity to restore um, like they like, I mean, they started with the Rouge National Urban Park as their first uh, national urban park. There's now a program to create many more. So that's underway as well. And it's not enough to obviously alone to save uh, nature in southern southern landscapes, but it's it's one piece that the feds are doing. Of course, again, as I said, most of southern Canada is private land. So this is where um, you know, organizations that are land trusts, both at the national level and local land trusts are so critical. And I do know that there is significant funding flowing to those land trusts from this conservation, uh, from these conservation envelopes to um, to enhance the work that's happening in southern Canada as well. It's a challenge for sure in southern Canada. Okay, uh, Bill Reese, you had uh, two or three sort of questions in a row there. Maybe you could sort of combine them. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, Allison's already answered a couple of them. Yeah. Yeah. To, uh, Okay, so you don't have a population policy within CPAS. We do understand. No, we don't. Okay, I think you really need one. Uh, let me just <laughs> elaborate for a second. It doesn't matter where people live. We, we talk about the urban footprint expanding, but a person living in a rural area in Canada still needs seven or eight hectares elsewhere on the landscape, either in Canada or elsewhere, to sustain our current lifestyles. So population is absolutely critical. So the question is, is conserving I mean, human beings are the most invasive of all species. <laughs> is conserving 50% of our lands and waters compatible with the, the, the push to raise the population to 100 million by 2100, which is really where the major conversation is taking place in Ottawa and in Ontario. Everybody wants to uh, you know, treble our population so we're more competitive mm -hmm. to get the growth going. I don't think you can do both. Any reaction? Well, I, you know, I think we, I, I, you know, population is obviously an issue. It's not one that we work on. And I think one of our success factors has been that we have been very focused in our, in our agenda and our mandate, because it's very easy to work on everything um, because there are so many issues to work on, but we do have a focused agenda. Um, I think planning is a key piece of this. Um, you know, we don't do a very good job of, of spatial planning um, and making sure, you know, there there are, if we did proactive conservation first spatial planning, we would at least identify areas that were, for example, important for, um, most important for minerals. And, um, and we would have the chance to have, make explicit decisions about trade-offs. And right now that's very difficult to do because we don't, I mean, in some areas there's good spatial planning happening, like in the Yukon, for example, there's a requirement for land use planning um, under the First Nations uh, land claim agreement. And that is kind of, it, that's an interesting process that's forcing those conversations about where we, you know, where we pursue mining, what we, what needs protection, what are the key ecological areas. So we can be much more efficient in our protection efforts if we actually know where the most important areas are for both, uh, um, you know, exploitation and for protection and make sure that we're protecting the most important areas rather than kind of making really significant trade-offs. And in which case you're gonna to have to protect a lot more of the landscape um, in order to deliver. So, I, I mean, that's, that's not, clearly this is a sticky problem, right? It's not, I'm, I, I'm no way dismissing the problem. Um, it's, I think spatial planning is part of the solution um, to kind of figure out where we're going uh, with this in a very explicit way and be able to, um, you know, have those conversations about trade-offs. All right, Richard uh, Vandriat, I think you had a question regarding Highway 14, 413, or is that a comment? I do, thank and you. And then out on deck would be um, John Hollins. Yes, uh, Allison, thank you. That was a good talk, and I, I appreciated it. I, it's, you're certainly making more progress, and I appreciate it. Um, I still, well, the, the question of 413, the, you mentioned the biodiversity agreement. It's uh, legally binding, but not enforceable. And I'm wondering, is that why we've got 
you know, Premier Ford, who's now deciding to, you know, push ahead with, high, you know, Highway 413, which is going to get rid of a lot of, you know, conserved territory or conservation areas. And it's a big loss, I think, for Ontario. It's very sad. And I'm wondering if CPAWS has tried to uh, do anything about that. And then I have a second question, which follows on that, but I'll see your answers on this mm -hmm. one first. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the the global framework is a lot, it's it's a global framework. So <laughs> it needs to be downscaled to the national level and then to the subnational level in Canada because of our constitutional division of powers, right? So, um, you know, it provides incentives, but it doesn't, it doesn't require a subnational government to get on board. Um, so that's kind of a, a challenge of the, the population kind of pushing their democratically elected governments to, uh, to get on board, I guess, which is, we know, a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, so that's at the global, basically the global legal framework. Um, I mean, I, I, to, to his credit, I mean, that's the, I think, at the national level, if we have a, a, um, a Biodiversity Accountability Act, it will at least help um, hold the federal government to account. I mean, not at that level of granularity, but at least to kind of planning and reporting and transparency and all of those kinds of things and delivery. So I yeah. think it will be helpful. Um, on the highway itself, I, I honestly, I live up here in, in uh, you know, Algonquin Anishinaabe territory in Chelsea, Quebec, and it's not, <laughs> it's not, I don't know the details of it, although I, I read the news. Um, our Wildlands League chapter based out of Toronto is involved with other groups in the, I know that they're working on the Greenbelt issues. I know it's, it's a collective kind of effort by conservation organizations in Ontario to combat some of these issues. And that, that's about the level that I know. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I can't, no, no, can't that's okay. answer in any more detail than that. Well, the other part of the question is Greta Thunberg, you know, she has stated frequently that every environmental conference, you know, when they had Paris, when they had Rio de Janeiro, when they had Tokyo, all these other conferences, they would have these lofty goals and they'd say, we've agreed on such such a goal. And she states, and I think correctly so, they never reach the agreements that they have stated. Mm -hmm. Now I'm wondering, is the COP conference that we just stated, is that going to be the same thing again? Or is she going to be coming back and saying, see, you never met your goals of COP? That's a great question because it's one that I didn't get into. I just kind of ran out of time. Um, but um, it has been a big part of the conversation in the lead up to COP. So I, I was on a secondment to an IUCN task force looking at right, you know, driving ambition in the global biodiversity framework for a couple of years, just pre-pandemic. Um, so I was at all these global meetings and it was a big conversation because the CBD itself and many other uh, international organizations have pointed out that we failed to deliver on the action targets utterly, like failed. <laughs> um, you know, the 17 and 10% targets weren't met, but they were probably the ones that were closest to being met. And there was some sense, well, why was that? What was the, what's the problem? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the accountability measures are the key problem. <laughs> um, it's easy to say yes and, and uh, low risk because you don't actually have to do it. Or the, the implications of not doing anything politically are, are low, uh, you know, existentially are high, but politically are low. Um, so there was, an, there was a lot of talk about that. Part of it was around the sense was there was never the financial resources to deliver. So that was a big part of the conversation. Um, there was uh, there, were not, there was a sense uh, that the ACHI targets never had um, like when they were adopted, there was no monitoring and reporting framework um, in place. And so, I mean, it was very simple. Like it just wasn't like there was not a scientifically based monitoring ref reporting uh, framework that included key indicators that were requiring um, governments to report back with those indicators. So this time there was a huge amount of effort put into developing a monitoring framework and indicators. Oh, hmm. They, and that were, in, that were adopted at, this, at COP as well. Like the global biodiversity framework was one thing, but there were many, many other <laughs> things going on around the global biodiversity framework, including this monitoring framework. It needs, still needs work, but there was also um, a technical working group struck to continue to work on this. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea is that that will be the requirement for governments to report out transparently on these science-based indicators. 
again, one piece. Um, so yeah, so there's a few things like that that, that are uh, being enacted. I do, I guess the other thing I would say is I, my observation would be that there is much more public awareness now than there was 13 years ago um, about the biodiversity crisis and the interconnections with the climate crisis. Um, and so I hope, I'm, I'm an eternal optimist. I mean, I wouldn't still be working in the NGO world after 20 years if I wasn't an optimist. It's hard to keep going. Um, but I do think that that is also hopeful. I think uh, citizens are going to do better at holding their governments to account. And I guess the final thing I would say is that there's finally recognition in the private sector. And I mean beyond, I don't just mean the resource sector, I mean in the finance sector um, of the problem and the need to act, like the linkages to the economy and the need to kind of direct finance away from destructive activities. So that conversation is also very live, for example, the World Economic Forum for now the third year in a row has identified biodiversity loss and climate change as the top threats, among the top threats, I would say, to the global economy and the, well, and the future of the planet. So I think these are indicators that we're in a bit of a different place than we were 2010. Uh, at least that's my optimist, my optimist perspective. <laughs> It's not easy, I know that. And it's gonna to continue to be a big challenge. Yeah, that makes sense because Art Carney is pushing for that, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's he's one of them. Like he was at, he's been speaking on these nature and climate issues. Like there's now a task force on nature related um, risk, uh, fine finance uh, risk. So like there is a, there's an initiative that is um, trying to get Com companies, private sector to report on nature, on climate related risk. There's now also an initiative on nature related risk. And there was hope that that would be a mandatory reporting requirement out of the global biodiversity framework. We didn't get there. I, the global biodiversity framework is not perfect. We lost ground on a number of targets. So there's some good stuff in there. If it's fully implemented, it will make a huge difference. It's as any global agreement never lands perfectly. <laughs> there's always compromises made. But. All right, let's move on to a question from John Hollins. And uh, on deck would be uh, John Mayer. Thank you, Nigel. Uh, first of all, thank you for your lucid presentation. It was wonderful to uh, listen to you and look at your slides. Um, I was delighted to learn that you felt proud to be a Canadian at COP15. Uh, and I say that because I really feel for Canadians from NGOs who go to the climate show, uh, I don't see how one could possibly be, be, be proud to be a Canadian in, in that setting. In fact, I'm glad I retired before we got to where we are. Um, look, um, compliments to, to CPOS for getting your agenda into the platforms of, I think, all the political parties for the 2015 uh, election. Um, most advocates that I know are anxious to get their ideas, their cases to the reigning federal or other government right now. And uh, that, that, that's a, an awful mistake because a governing party is overwhelmed by its, tar its, its task. It doesn't have time to listen to you. And my experience with politicians is they don't listen to anybody's agenda until they figured it out for themselves. So um, what I would like to know as a sort of a, as a kind of a mechanic in, in the area, in which, how did C. Paul's find the patience to look so far ahead and I don't, uh, to, to, uh, I, to, 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 to get your interests into the political process. You, you must have had an enormous patience to do that. Have you got any advice how other advocates 
might find that patience or learn simply the mechanics that you did, which meant not just going to the governing party, but to all those parties that were likely to be in the parliament that was to be elected. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, and thank you for your kind comments. Um, you know, CPAS is a charity and we are nonpartisan by law and we take that very seriously. So whenever we are pushing for things like that, we are pushing all parties <laughs> and putting things out for all, you know, to all perspectives. And I would say um, we've, and, and I'm not sure that patience is the right word. I mean, we've been working on these issues for a very long time. I think focus might be a, a better word. Um, the longer I'm in this world, I, I often kind of joke to people that my theory of change is persistence. <laughs> so if you just keep going at something for long enough and you do it relatively smartly, then you're likely to, to make progress. But, um, but I do, I mean, we do see elections as opportunities to get um, commitments made and, uh, and big commitments made. And, you know, that's, it, it was during the, the 2019 election that the 30 by 30 commitment was made. And again, we were pushing that. Um, the environmental community to, comes together around elections as well. And we kind of tend to push common kind of priorities, which I think is helpful, again, to all parties. Um, and we hope that, you know, we get, we get, uh, we get pickup. Um, I also have said recently to a couple of people that the longer I'm in this world, the more I realize that conservation is really about relationships. Um, it's about relationships on the ground with local communities, with indigenous peoples. It's about relationships with governments, um, whether they be uh, indigenous governments, uh, municipal governments, federal government, pro provincial, territorial. And so having those relationships is always helpful <laughs> when um, you're trying to get something built. So I, I do recall, and that was a while back, 2015, but I do recall we, um, we started working on it a year before the election. And there's a couple of things that have happened actually that make it easier. So now we have more fixed election dates. I mean, they're not fixed, fixed, but <laughs> there's a bit of a better idea of when they're gonna happen, a bit more predictability. We also now have at the federal level, publicly accessible mandate letters, which has been hugely different. Like until 2015, we had no idea what the prime minister had told a minister to work on. You could sometimes get some insight into, you know, intel, but it was very difficult because these were closely guarded documents. Whereas now in 2015, this government decided they were gonna be public documents. And that is enormously helpful because we see right away if there's a, a, the public sees what the minister has been instructed to do, and then you can hold them accountable for it. Um, do you have any, I, sorry, do you have any yeah. idea how your platform got into the mandate letter? Oh, we just kept agitating. <laughs> After they made the commitment, in the, you know, it's, it's a matter of keeping at it, right? I mean, it lead up to the 2015 election, we used to do what we called, uh, we called lobby days. They were really CFAWs on the Hill days where they were relationship building. We'd bring people in from across the country and we'd meet with, you know, 50, 70 MPs in the course of a day and spread out across the Hill and just let people know who CFAWs is and from all parties. So the year before we thought there was this election was going to happen, we focused on the need to commit to these. Um, to these targets. So that was, so it was across the board, just one tactic. Then we wrote a report. Um, well, we wrote a couple of reports. We did an ocean report and a, a terrestrial report demonstrating again, similar to the one I talked about, that this was an achievable agenda. So again, put out publicly, this, this is achievable. We're not asking you to do pie in the sky, something that you're gonna have trouble with later. This is achievable, not easy, but achievable. Um, so we did that, and that I think helped because we could demonstrate. We could say, "Look, you know, <laughs> this is realistic. Here's the here's the path forward." Um, and then we just talked to a lot of people. And uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, um, John Mayer, you're next, and on deck would be uh, John Leg. Yep, Allison, I thought your presentation was very very well put together. So thank you. Welcome. Yeah. The, uh, the question, uh, while we're busy paving over the best farmland uh, in the country, uh, I think probably for every hectare uh, we destroy, uh, we're, we're probably uh, destroying about uh, 
what, 10 tons of biomass uh, at least. And uh, if we're up north, uh, which is principally where I think your savings, uh, uh, your conservation measures take place, uh, you, you would have to save like uh, uh, many, many hundreds of hectares to uh, give an equivalent uh, in, in biomass. So the question is basically, uh, is there any kind, have you worked on any kind of equivalency? Uh, you know, what, if you're going to save a, a, kilom a square kilometer in uh, the Amazon rainforest, uh, how many kilometers uh, would you have to save in the uh, Sahara Desert? Uh, <laughs> Know, uh, as an equivalent, but what's the biomass? Uh, the bottom line, because that's that's what it comes down to. Uh, uh, you're ultimately looking at biomass. Uh, that's what we're trying to conserve, I, I believe. Uh, uh, and the species, uh, I, I think, is directly associated with biomass. So that's the question: uh, yeah, Do you have a biomass thing. equivalent? I don't. Um, I I do think though that. Um, it's not just about biomass, it's about diversity. It's about every species playing a role in the ecosystem and you know the web of life. And so, and there's a couple, there's a couple angles to this. So biomass is also linked to carbon, I would say. Um, and there are, um, you know, for example, Canada has um, some of the biggest uh, ecological carbon stores on the planet. Um, and I actually took out a map that I have, I was trying to shrink down my presentation a bit, and I took out a great map that just showed how Canada is a hotspot for um, carbon, for the intersection between biodiversity values and carbon storage and places like the Hudson Bay lowlands in places like the old growth rainforest um, on the West Coast. So when you take into account carbon and uh, biodiversity, we are actually a global hotspot. I'd say the other thing is Canada is responsible for Canada's biodiversity. I mean, we also have international responsibilities, but um, you know, we need to be saving the diversity of life in Canada. And so that includes absolutely Southern landscapes. And I, you know, our focus tends to be, well, in our report tended to be a little further North. There are projects in Southern Canada and this was not meant to be comprehensive either. And also Southern Canada, again, because it's, a lot of its private land is not the landscape that we work in, but we work with partners in those landscapes. So um, there are lots of obviously opportunities there. Um, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought here, but I don't have a compare. I don't have the, that comparison in my head. Um, I do know there's lots of biodiverse areas with high carbon value in Canada that need to be protected. And we need, again, it's, it's it, a lot of this is about planning. It's about that spatial planning and overlaying the various values and coming up with the best plan to balance the needs of conservation with the needs of agriculture, with the needs of people. Um, and, you know, some of our colleagues do much more work in the agricultural landscape, but we do a little bit in the prairies. Um, but, you know, Ducks Unlimited and others are working very hard in the agricultural landscape. Nature United is doing a bunch of carbon modeling in the, in the, in the, uh, the agricultural landscape. It doesn't tend to be, we don't tend to do as much in that landscape, but still important. Lots to do. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, John uh, and uh, Ted Manning, uh, I'm not sure if you had a comment or a question. If... Uh, if, uh, if you have a question, you're on deck. Um, if you just had a comment, uh, then we'll move on. The next questioner would be David Doherty. So go ahead, John. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Nigel. Allison, congratulations for all your work. Before, uh, in CPAWS, before and at the most recent COP, I can tell you right at the beginning that I uh, support uh, Bill Reese's comments. And I would like to point out, well, you know this, and I understand what I'm going to say it is not making, won't make life easier for you. But uh, Bill Reese mentioned that uh, the most invasive species is the Homo sapiens. <laughs> and uh, I would like to pick up that theme and say that uh, I'd like to quote you. You said that your success, and I, you're talking about CPAWS, uh, 
was your ability to concentrate on your own targets. And uh, with due respect, I disagree that that's the right uh, strategy. I would like to see CPAWS take on those people who want to make Canada's cities larger. And these are the same people that keep increasing Canada's immigration targets. And once again, if I have uh, mis if I'm misquoting uh, Bill Reese, I think he said something like, you cannot have both more biodiversity and more population. So uh, apart from ego, uh, this is just a, a cheap shot here at <laughs> politicians, but apart from ego, it, it's beyond me why uh, the, the targets for immigration keep going up. Uh, if you're a leader, of course, it gives you more uh, satisfaction, maybe, to be the uh, the leader of a larger a larger population. But I, I just don't see it because it's completely against all of the Club of Rome's uh, principles. So, uh, what is your reaction to my wanting you to uh, take on more conflict? with the others who want to build up the population when in fact, as far as I can see, it's completely against the whole idea of protecting biodiversity. Over to you. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> well, I don't, I mean, I, I think I sort of said, said what I can say about that. Um, I, I mean, I, I, when I said our success was based on focus, I do think it's easy for organizations to try and take on everything and, and achieve nothing. And I think we do need to be cautious about that because there are so many problems in the world, right? And then there's so many challenges and there are an ecosystem of NGOs as well, right? Who hopefully at our best are at our best when we work together and kind of uh, divvy up the, the roles. And so this isn't a role that CPAWS has taken on. And I, I mean, I'm not the board of CPAWS. I don't make these decisions, but, but I suspect it's one that we will not um, take on um, in any, in, at any way, apart from um, figuring out how people can live on the landscape um, in a more, you know, a more coherent way and, and making those improvements. We're going to make progress where we can and, and seize opportunities when we, where we can to improve the situation. And we have a very clear, clear goal and target. And uh, that's what we're going to keep working on as part of the ecosystem of groups that are trying to make the world a better place. <laughs> okay, I understand your position, even though I don't agree with it. <laughs> Respect yours too. <laughs> Oh, uh, Ted, did, did you wish to ask a question? Yes, I do. I'll just say okay. I was in the same uh, field just as you have been for many years. I was the head of land use planning for Environment Canada, and it's frustrating. And uh, I essentially I agree with all of the concerns that we have that we essentially building building ourselves out of ecosystems, uh, particularly in the south. Uh, my question is, because we have almost all delivery happening by the provinces, sometimes by municipalities. I found it was very much easier to negotiate with Quebecers and with British Columbians than with most of the other provinces to get them to buy into the notion of protection. My question is therefore, do you have any opinions on who is easiest to deal with and how do we get the rest to come along? Uh, well, thanks for the question, Ted. And I, I thought I recognized your name, so I, I'm sure you were yeah. in Environment Canada mm -hmm. when I was uh, when I was. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, that's a tough one. Uh, I mean, it comes and goes, right? Like been tough for ten years or fifty it, years. <laughs> yeah, and it, there's always going to be one of my one of my kind of senses is that there, in look at as a national organization with kind of regional representation, is that there's always somewhere where you can make progress. And so you got to keep working away, getting ready, identifying areas for protection, building the relationships. And then at some point, 
a political window opens and if you're ready, you kind of shove it through, right? And I know, I know <laughs> the federal government does this as well in, in much, of their, uh, much of their work, but, um, but yeah, I mean, we rely on, on, um, on provincial and territorial government. So in part of, part of my answer would be the increased recognition of indigenous leadership means that there are governments, indigenous governments who have power um, right. and have rights who are championing land protection and are increasingly recognized and uh, for that. And so that is part of the path forward is that it's not just provincial and territorial governments, indigenous governments, indigenous nations have rights um, and they are have authority and at least co-governed authority and they are using that. So for an example, I mentioned the Peel River watershed, which is a massive, and again, it's a Northern example. Um, I spent a lot of my time in the last 20 years working on Northern issues. So I tend to be more familiar with that because the federal government had more jurisdiction in the North until recently. So um, the Peel River watershed was protected, was identified for protection through a land use planning process that was mandated in the land claim agreement, the Yukon final agreement with First Nation, with Yukon First Nations. So there was a requirement to apply the, for the federal, territorial, and First Nations governments to do land use planning through the process identified. They did that. They identified a massive, the, the land use planning committee identified a massive proportion of the watershed for protection. The Yukon government at the time said, oh, we disagree, too much protection, we're gonna do our own land use plan. Mm -hmm. The First Nations and CEPAWS and the Yukon Conservation Society together collectively went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada to challenge that decision and defend the process that was embedded in the, in the First Nations final agreement with Thomas Berger, who was a very famous figure in Canadian history, a lawyer who, who um, did the McKenzie Valley pipeline study back in the seventies. Um, and we won. Mm -hmm. And so the Peel River watershed, the whole, the full, you know, massive area is the, the I think it's 70% of the watershed or something is protected, it's now counted. It's, um, and the, uh, the process was defended. So, that's why there's so much opportunity in the, we see in the Yukon, because we know that First Nations will bring large areas of protection of their traditional territories to those land use planning tables. And they have, like, they have authority. They have co-governed authority, but they have authority to do that. And so working with First Nations, supporting Indigenous-led conservation is such an important path forward. And that is, I think, being clarified over the last decades through Supreme Court decisions, et cetera. And so that to me is one of the ways of moving forward, um, regardless of what provinces and territories think. And then of course there's public, public support and public pressure and highlighting that is also important to get governments on board. And I mean, I- That's what I, that's what I think you guys are best at. So please keep up the work. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. And it's an amazing, I work with an amazing team. So mm -hmm. this is me. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ted. So David Doherty, and then uh, next would be uh, Claude Butner. Uh, thanks very much for the talk today, Allison. I was wondering if I could get a comment. It's kind of a follow on from what Ted Manning just asked. And it's this, what would it take, in your opinion, to get Canada's conservative parties to endorse conservation? Mm -hmm. It's an interesting question. Um, you know, one of the reasons I, I like working in conservation is that it's less, it, um, it's more of a core value of Canadians regardless of their political stripes. Um, and I, I say that because all the polling shows that there is strong support across the board for protecting much more land and ocean. Um, I published a paper with um, a colleague from the University of Northern British Columbia who, who we did a global, we did a Canadian version of a global study called the Space for Nature um, survey, which basically asked people how much of Canada's land and among other things, and ocean, they wanted to protect it. And in, if you asked it as an open-ended question, they say half, like that's true around the world. It's true across political stripes. It's true across Canada. So, um, you know, I, that's a high level theoretical kind of 
protection, not in your backyard kind of conversation, but it, there is strong public support. So how do we demonstrate that? I mean, I think the world has become a more divided place now, but I also note that I live in Quebec. Our government is essentially a conservative government. They have adopted the 30 by 30 target and are working on delivering it. They delivered, they're only the province to adopt the past targets and deliver on them. So um, they, I think Quebecers see this as a priority and there's a very organized NGO community in Quebec that kind of elevates these issues um, and it's working, right? So, and I would also say that under, you know, in the period of 2005 to 2015 or 2006 to 2015 um, under the federal government, we, we got a lot of things done. We didn't talk about it in the framework of large global targets, but when it came to implementation on the ground, we got a lot of things done. A lot of national parks kind of created with indigenous nations, things that had been in the works for a long time. It's, it, it was about how to frame the conversation um, rather than whether there was support for that kind of activity. So I think there's lots of potential there. I know like, there are some places where it's very difficult right now and I don't have a solution there, but I would also say, for example, in Alberta, you know, the Alberta government tried to delist a whole lot of its provincial parks um, and privatize them. And then they opened up the Eastern slopes to coal mining. There was such public backlash that they had to back down. And that's in a place where that's difficult to achieve for the government. But uh, I think at one point, CPAS had put out, had produced 13,000 lawn signs or something for their defend, defend Alberta Parks campaign. And because Albertans care about their parks, they care about the Eastern slopes and they were mobilized. Um, and it was farmers, it was ran ranchers, it was um, you know conservationists, it was urban folks, it was rural folks all mobilizing around defending a place that they love. And so it is possible um, to kind of maintain those kind of places. And uh, it's a lot of work though. So um, yeah, civil society, I think plays a, an incredibly important role in, in making these things happen or defending places from having bad things happen to them. And it's, we're never gonna be out of a job, right? Like we're, never, we're always gonna have work to do on this front. Yeah, sadly, I think we've got a number of provinces uh, that don't give us any hope. Yeah, I'll, an another example, um, Nova Scotia. In the recent election, they committed to 20% target, which is a big target for Nova Scotia. Half their land is private. And they've, you know, it's a very crowded landscape. And they, uh, it was the conservative government in the last election that had the highest target in the uh, in the. Uh, in the election among all the parties and they won and now they're implementing their 20% target. So hmm. it's possible, depends. On the Thank you. Okay, Claude, Claude Butner, and then on deck uh, will be Phil Riley. And I think that might be the time to uh, bring things to a close after, after Phil's question. Go ahead, Claude. Thank you so much, Allison, for your presentation and, and especially for your um, uh, your encouragement that sometimes the uh, the courts actually make all the difference and that's what you're working towards. So my, my first question, and I think I'll skip my second question, that was more of a complaining, giving you a, uh, some space to speculate for the, the future when things really start falling apart. But my first question is, um, because I had a lot of discussions with uh, native species uh, or uh, about native species. When the climate changes, the precipitation changes, uh, the latitude we're on, the, you know, the, the last hundred years of what we know of in a particular location has changed. And that latitude equivalent is up north. And so if those species, be it bugs, rabbits, squirrels, whatever, move north, then yes, they are technically invasive, but they're actually following their climate. And the same thing with the species that come up, the opossums that we rarely see in Minnesota suddenly might be really popular uh, just because now the weather is just like it used to be in uh, Missouri. So is this ever part of the, the conversations you have on how, you know, maybe these are unmanaged reserves, by the way, and but where people are and someone says, we ought to do something, we ought to have a hunt, you know, the city ought to cull this, you know, growing population. And it's like, well, wait a second, 
you know, they're, they're losing their southern uh, range. Any comments you want to make on along these lines? Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt this is going to be tough, right? It's going to be, we are going to see different ecosystems being created as things move around. I mean, the best that we can do, I think, um, in terms of, you know, resilience of ecosystems is to make sure there is space to move. <laughs> like nature's on the move, right? And we know yeah. that because of climate change. And so it's, it's always been important to have connected networks of protected areas, both to support migration and genetic flow, et cetera. It is all the more important and critical now to have connected networks of, of um, protected areas to enable ecosystems to adapt and they're going to change. And we're going to have to think about in more detail about what we do about that. Um, but, you know, and there are some who say, well, you know, connectivity can enhance uh, invasive species. Yes, in some cases, but also we need to be able to allow those. They're going to have to remix and rejig over time because that's what climate change is going to ha make happen. So we're going to have to figure this out. Um, but having those uh, enough space for nature and the right designs of space for nature, for example, in networks of protected areas, making sure that we're looking at um, uh, climate refugia, for example, as priority spaces that need protection and doing that analysis. And again, again I keep harping on planning, but, um, but those conservation planning initiatives have to build in um, climate change considerations. And, you know, it's, I'm not a specialist in that particularly at, at any in science as a scientist, but, um, but there are people working on this and thinking about it. And it is, it is a critical piece. And thank you for bringing it up. Thank you. Your answer. Okay, Phil Riley. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. You certainly got my mind spinning on a couple of different uh, topics. But one of the things that I'll just ask you to, con to confirm is that CPAWS is focused on parks and wilderness areas. Am I correct? So we have a focus on protecting land and oceans. So protected areas, part which include parks, um, you know, wild spaces, natural areas. Yes, um, we don't. Like it's not. It's, that's our core focus. Um, we will also take on where necessary um, efforts, like for example, I mentioned in Alberta, where there's a threat to those natural ecosystems, even if they're not protected. We need to maintain the natural ecosystems as a step towards towards greater protection. So yes, that's our core area of focus with the goal of, of conserving nature. So my focus is agricultural and the life forms that provide the food and the food web that mm -hmm. we depend upon. Uh, not necessarily the principal focus of CPAWS, I don't think. But then the conversation just previous to uh, Claude's had to do with land and i'm thinking of the tragedy of the commons that in the southern portions of canada we have private lands not common lands and so how how do we overcome the lack of the ability of the public to be able to direct what is best for them when there are vested interests that sort of say what's best for you is not best for me yeah, I mean, I think that, again, different tools, different approaches in different parts of the landscape, depending on the context, right? So there is a whole component of the conservation community who focus on private land and working on, again, relationship-based and, and purchasing lands where they're available and um, encouraging landowners to put conservation easements on and educating landowners about what's possible on their lands. Um, and that, you know, the Nature Conservancy of Canada, there's local land trusts, there's networks of local land trusts at the Canadian level. I mean, we have one, my husband's involved with one here in Chelsea, and so where we're buying land. So again, a different approach. It's about um, ensuring people understand the importance of conserving land. And I'm not, I'm not talking specifically about agricultural land, but it includes agricultural land. I think there is a big role for working with farmers um, and ranchers, you know, in the prairies, in the grasslands. It's the only way we're going to make progress on what is the most endangered ecosystem globally and in Canada, grasslands, native grasslands. So, um, you know, there, it, I talked about OECMs, 
one of the places that OECMs could be very valuable is in the prairies on those grassland areas that are, if they are grazed appropriately and managed for biodiversity, um, it can be really a compatible use to have uh, grazing and, um, and conservation goals. And so we've seen that um, on the prairies, a lot of areas that, you know, no, they no longer have bison, but if you graze cattle in a, in a certain way and manage cattle in a certain way, it can mimic um, those pressures to some degree and help to save the last remaining grasslands from being plowed under. And so there's lots of opportunity for that. Um, and, you know, again, our, our, my, our folks on the ground do a lot more of this work depending on where they are. Like our, our Saskatchewan chapter does work on grasslands because they live in Saskatchewan. So they're working with the provincial government on that and with landowners. Um, in Southern Ontario, they do more work on agricultural stuff as well. And, and other groups are working on agricultural initiatives. So it's all important everywhere. We need conservation everywhere. How we do it depends on the context. Yeah, so I have money invested in a land trust as well. So I understand the importance of it uh, in terms of having public participation. But also our uh, wells on our rural property were part of a regional water testing program. And one of the things that concerns me is because I have farmers who are spraying their lands in order to give them better crops with less effort my water quality is going down to the point that both well not both quality but also quantity too the the water table is going down the water is becoming less uh productive from the point of view of the flora and fauna of the soil that no longer live in the quality of water which is being available to them so this is where i come back to the tragedy of the commons is that mm -hmm. really all society should be responsible in some way or another for the continuance of good quality land and insect mm -hmm. pollinators uh all of the different species that provide us with our health and our our life and yeah, i agree with you phil and i think there are examples and maybe you know it's just needs to be built on but there are examples of this i you know i mean i'm sitting on a couple acres of land here in the hills and and i can't do whatever i want on my property, right? Like I'm not allowed to clear cut the forest on my property. I own the property, but there's a common interest in maintaining forest in the community. So there are bylaws that control what I can do. I can't, I don't control the wildlife. That's the provincial government that can, that is responsible for managing the wildlife, even though it's on my property. And I think the same, like we have bylaws around in our community about protecting wetlands and you're not allowed to develop in wetlands. And so I think there are public good mechanisms and legal mechanisms that do apply to private land and perhaps they need to be enhanced to incorporate biodiversity as well as some of these other values but uh, I think we are um, that the potential's there and I think it's a good point that you know maybe that's a, a an interesting area to pursue well thank you again Allison so my thanks I've had I think we've had an excellent uh, exchange uh, through these questions and I'm going to hand over to our chair, Jean Doherty, to, uh, who will deliver the final blessing. And uh, <laughs> Jean. Thank you, Nigel. And Allison, thank you very much for um, a, a, a wonderful presentation. It was very wide ranging. And uh, I will echo what many others have said. Congratulations on actually getting traction with the uh, governments to be able to do something. This was, uh, this was really quite an eye opener for me. So I'd like to thank you very much on behalf of KCOR for coming to us and giving us this presentation that gives us some thought. Um, with that, I'd like to say uh, to everybody here who has stayed on, thank you very much. And I encourage you to, uh, if you want to see this presentation or any of the others, to go to our CanadianCore.com website and log into the stay informed section and you should be able to find this and other presentations that have been uh, given to KCOR over the last uh, two and a half years at this point. Anyway, and thank you very much for that. Also, if you're interested in becoming part of the KCOR group, you are welcome to join there for membership. And at this time of year, I'd like to encourage current members to actually renew your membership. That would be great as well. And um, also, if you would um, 
subscribe to our channel, our YouTube channel, that would be helpful for everybody as well. And with that, I would like to say thank you to everybody for coming today. And I look forward to the open discussion that will happen afterward. Thank you. Thank you very much.